So my animation story, my animation journey started really early. I was lucky. I went to a school in Southern California in the San Gabriel Valley Public Junior High, and they had an animation class. And I made really simple um, stop motion animated films on Super 8 film. And um, some of them didn't really even turn out, but it was like, it just planted the idea of this being something cool. And then it turned out that the high school that I went to, uh, Roland High School, had a really great animation program taught by uh, someone named Dave Master, who was like a, he was like a ex hippie who also was a union organizer who decided he was gonna do something really subversive and teach animation to public high school kids who oh, nice. had no access to it. And he ran an amazing program. We had like Chuck Jones come and visit us. We had folks from, um, you know, uh, animated stop motion animators from Nightmare Before Christmas. Kathleen Kennedy came to one of our open houses. So like a lot of people that were, uh, Tom Cito also, great animator, came to visit us. A lot of people who were in Hollywood learned about it because they had relationships with Dave and they would come and do portfolio reviews for us. And this was a way for like us to imagine ourselves as like actually being filmmakers. And so that's where the idea of like, I'm going to be a filmmaker and animation is going to be my medium really became something that I um, started to feel strongly about. And then I went to USC and did a proper film degree um, because I thought, felt, I thought, this is how little I do. I thought filmmakers need to learn about film theory. So oh. I studied film theory. Um, and I, that's then where I fell in love with the, uh, the French new wave. And I thought that, you know, that is still something that stays with me. This idea that people who think deeply about cinema then become filmmakers and in, in that order, um, because I feel like that's maybe the kind of person I am. Um, and after that, then I thought, okay, I, I still really need more skills. So I did an MFA in animation and digital arts. Um, and that's where I really got into, um, computer graphics and okay. learned about um, 3D animation and Maya and rendering and all this stuff. And after I left school, um, within a year or so, I got a job as an ATD at Disney Feature Animation and they were just starting their, um, like, I guess their third wave of, of animated films because they were getting into CG. So they were doing Chicken Little at the time. And that was like really kind of cool because I was working for this company that had amazing legacy, but they were kind of operating like a startup because they were figuring out how to make CG films uh -huh. um, from their from their studio perspective. And so that was a really great time. And I learned a lot. And then I um, moved over to Weta Digital in 2005. And I did another short stint at Disney, like, um, you know, in 2010. But pretty much I worked at Weta Digital for eight years on a bunch of other, like, then I moved into like big budget VFX films like Avatar, Planet of the Apes, All the Hobbits, bunch of adventure, um, Avengers film. And then I just got kind of uh, a little bit burned out. Well, a lot burned out, but also other things happened. Like I had, I started to remember why I went to film school, why I went to art school, and that I was actually supposed to be an artist telling my own story and doing my own work. Um, while I was working on The Hobbits, I did an MA in creative writing and started working on a novel based on my family story. And so that kind of just like inception this idea into my head that like, I need to get serious about my own practice. Wow. So I left, um, I started teaching and now the teaching at Victoria University in Wellington has really become the thing that has allowed me to make my own work and to teach and for that to be this like really great ecosystem that informs each other. So um, this year, my my directorial debut um, played at, uh, like it, it's a VR project based on my experience of, um, my husband and I wrote it together and it's our experience of having our son and going through miscarriage. And it's kind of this like speculative, um, it's about a couple who experience a series of miscarriages and come to believe their children are being born in another dimension. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it's a CG VR speculative kind of uh, sci-fi story, and it got incubated at Sundance in 2018, and then it's basically played at Tribeca, Cannes, Venice, like all the festivals this year. And so I've been really busy with that this year and kind of talking finally about the process of making that project. I, you mentioned like being a TD, and just for maybe some viewers that are not familiar with what that actually means, can you 
break down the acronym and then also mm. what the job consists of sometimes. Yeah. So lighting technical director, <laughs> technical director is this catch all phrase that gets used in visual effects. And it can, uh, if you're a generalist, you're just a TD and you do a lot of different things. Um, and if you're a specialist, then you get that specialty attached to it. So there's like a layout TD, an animation TD, lighting TD. And what a lighting TD does is it's, um, it's a combination of art and, te and, and technical roles. So you're doing a lot of uh, optimization of things, you're debugging, you're figuring, you're problem solving. When things don't work, when the render doesn't work, when things fail, you're figuring out why that's happening. But the art side of it is really cool. Like the art side is if you're um, working on a show early on, then you're working with the art director and the visual effects supervisor and you're figuring out what is the look so you're doing like art direction you're doing a lot of look development um, you're setting up lights and you know kind of operating like a cinematographer and a gaffer at the same time so you have this like art overview but then you're also the person that actually goes and sets up the digital lights so it's both of those things in painting with light um, John Alton, um, who was a classic Hollywood cinematographer in this period, gives some context for why DeMille would have needed to come up with another way to shoot the close-up. In the early days of cinema, they do a single setup on a film set, meaning they'd shoot the wide shot using a long lens. Um, uh, and then when they needed a close-up, they would change the lens to a wide angle and shoot that. Um, and there was it was just one lighting setup for the entire thing. The results were, of course, flat and boring because what you ended up with were close-ups lit like a wide establishing shot. So starting with DeMille, an entire language was developed for setting up close-ups, along with understanding that every shot needs its own lighting. And this is, this is why lighters get work, because there's no such thing as the one-button render. Directors and supervisors like to art direct to a high level of detail, and each shot is bespoke. So this is my experience in working on all the films that I ever worked on, which is that like the idea is that you light for a sequence of shots um, and that there's consistency across that sequence, of course. Um, but there's no such thing as a single setup that works across the board. And what we're always doing is we're going in and we're making adjustments. And the reason we have to make adjustments is because we're lighting for subjects. So even if the environment remains the same, the subject moves around and you have to light for the eyes. This is one of my, this is one of my favorite images from any of the Hobbit films um, because we, I remember the, the, the lighting leads and supervisors specifically talking about this Rembrandt lighting style. And it's absolutely true that like with creature lighting in particular, the uglier the creature is, the more um, beautiful the lighting has to be. Uh, there's there's some kind of relationship there. And if you watch visual effects films, you'll notice this. And so this is absolutely a Rembrandt style lighting. I think it's you know more complex because there's a lot more uh, special. So there's like edge lighting here to, set, to push him forward and separate him from the background. Um, but in terms of like the basic lighting setup, you've got the key. Rembrandt, which again, this uh, highlight is sitting right at the edge of the um, the the eyeball, just as we saw in those Rembrandt paintings. And then there's this very soft triangle as the light falls off. Yeah. So it's, the question is: Are there any prominent cinematographers or lighters that are doing work in lighting dark-skinned characters outside of the folks from Issa Rae's *Insecure*? Yeah, so the the cinematographer I don't remember his name that has uh, that worked with Spike Lee, for example. There was a lot of discussion on a bunch of early Spike Lee films, like "Do the Right Thing," "She's Got to Have It," um, and this idea of lighting skin for black actors and people of color, and um, you know, best practices around that. So, like, I I think watching some of those early Spike Lee films is a really great way to to see like how in the 90s, for example, this was a, a departure and, and a really needed and important one that I think from that moment forward, uh, that, that cinematographer established a lot of good practices that have come to be um, more widely adopted. What I find um, 
with, with, you know, with CG, I just find like most of the important work needs to be done on the character shading side, like with the skin itself, like uh, global illumination, subsurface scattering, the texture. Um, there's a really interesting case study of, um, what was it? Uh, Wreck-It Ralph, the Disney film. Um, so Princess Tiana was the first black female princess, right? And um, it was a 2D film. What was it? The 2D. Mm -hmm. The Frog Princess, yeah. So, there, so Princess Tiana was in The Frog Princess, and she was a 2D princess. And then what happened is um, Disney decided to do some scene in Wreck-It Ralph where all the princesses were, like, contemporary. And for the first time, Princess Tiana became a 3D princess. Right. And there was a trailer, and suddenly she was, like, three shades lighter than she was in the 2D version. Yep. And the audience, you know, fans were like, what's happening? And there was an outroar. And I know that at that time, I just happened to know that there were no people of color in the shading department at, wow. on that team. And, you know, there have never been any people of color in the shading department on most of the teams I've worked on. So this is a huge problem. Um, and one that could have easily been addressed and resolved if there had been better thinking and inclusion on the creative team early on. Of course, viewers chime in and add your questions in the chat. I My mind has just been going and I've been taking my notes down um, for myself. So my, my first, kind of still going back to what I had asked you before is again, this is like back in like thesis days, we would set up um, a light like this and they would, well, I wouldn't say they would encourage us. I don't know where the idea came from, but we would attach the the lights to like the rig right so like <laughs> you're not doing that and i i really like the idea of what you're saying is having the characters walk through it but it was like wow you get this amazing light like lit character and you have to put them in different you know shots or whatever so you just parent it connect it so what is yeah. your commentary for that yeah, so I have seen that, and I've also seen it done in feature animation, and the things that people do in feature animation are different than the things that people do in live action VFX, and that's okay, because in feature animation, your art directing goals are different. You're not matching to a plate in the way, like in, in live action, you're usually matching to a plate, except for Avatar, because it's essentially a feature animated film, right? <laughs> um, but if you're matching to a plate, that's your ground truth and you must adhere to it because okay. every shot has to match. When you're doing feature animation stuff, you can get away with a lot and it really has to do with your goals. So I think the reason people do that is because, especially back in the day, they wanted those eye highlights. So the light rig would allow the character's eye highlight to sort of remain no matter where they were moving. We don't need to do that anymore because we have image-based lighting, mm -hmm. which I didn't talk about here at all. But actually, if you go to my, um, if you if we go back to this web page, um, I have this HDRI workflow, mm -hmm. which is like really specific to my class. If, if you if you want to understand what HDRI and image based lighting is, you can quickly read through this and why we're doing it. But there's a lot of there's a lot of great tutorials online. For and what this means is, you capture your environment light. Um, and then it, it's like this dome that sits in your um, digital environment and it functions like the real world would. So, you know, here, for example, we've got these top uh, lights and this is how this is how Hobbit was lit. Actually, um, they shot all this stuff on a stage with these top lit stage lights. And then when the, um, for example, the dwarves were like in the misty mountains and they were like scrambling around on the mount the cliffside they were actually being lit from the top by these lights because it was an image based light captured on set then brought into the digital environment so that their eyes and skin was always responding to this environment light so wow. i think that those things that people used to do to like parent rig light rigs to characters were because we didn't have image based lighting particularly what has come to be known as the rembrandt lighting style which is a lighting technique that came to be used across Renaissance portraiture painting. Its signature, I don't know if you can see my, um, my mouse here, but its signature is the illuminated triangle under the eye of the subject on the less illuminated side of the face. 
the triangle is no longer than the nose and no wider than the eye. Okay, so imagine that there's a key light here on this side. It's probably positioned somewhere to the top and pointing down, um, almost like a 45 degree angle. And it's casting this shadow of the nose, which then allows this triangle to be created on the shadow side of the face. And that's pretty much it. That's the Rembrandt light. And so we, if you study Rembrandt's portraits, you see this way of lighting faces over and over again. Regardless of how bright or contrasty or dark the overall image is, this quality is always there. So this, this particular image on the right is very contrasty. It's very bright. You have this triangle here. So this is a little bit softer. And then again, even at a slightly wider angle, like it's always there. And the, 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 the second effect of this um, is the way in which the eye highlights are positioned, right? So there's, there's an accuracy there where you almost don't even need to worry about what's happening with the triangle or the shadow or the uh, key side. Um, if you look at just the eye reflection, you know that the size of the light and where it's positioned. Um, this is a fairly small light, and it's probably somewhere here. Same thing here. And there's something also very flattering about the eye highlight sitting between the iris and the pupil at the edge of the eye in this particular way. If you go back and you watch some horror films, you'll notice that um, you know what horror lighting is, right? It's like it's lighting that comes from below. It shines up into the face. It like creates this unnatural kind of shadow. And then another thing that horror films do is they might position a light so that the eye highlight uh, is right in the middle of the eye. And that is horrifying and actually very, um, it creates anxiety. Like it's, it's, it, it's not beautiful at all. It's, it's the exact opposite of it. So the thing to actually look for when you're analyzing um, lighting is to look at what's happening with the eye highlight, the reflection in the eye. And then that'll tell you everything you need to know about the size of the light and where it's positioned. So this is a, a theme that comes up over and over again uh, in visual effects and something that I learned in my years at Weta, which is you just if you light for the eyes, everything else falls into place. And, you know, there's all these cliches about the eyes being the whatever window to the soul and, you know, whatever. Um, but it's actually very technical and accurate in that the eyes tell you everything you need to know about the context of where the subject is sitting um, and help you either deconstruct the lighting setup or um, try to replicate it. And it's, you know what a light is doing by how it responds to material. So you know that like certain kinds of fabric is shiny or transparent or rough, or um, you, know, you, you know that uh, certain kinds of leaves have more specularity than others because of the way that light respond, how, how those materials respond to light. If everything has the same material, then you don't really understand what's happening with light. But there are some basic principles that we can explore with value um, and diffuse lighting um, that will, that you know, without getting too far into the weeds on materials. But just so you understand, um, I'll go here into my material context and I'll show you like, this is a basic shading network that I have created for this character. So for example, um, here's the eyes, you know, it's really basic. It's it's not it's not very detailed. I've got like usually a base color texture, and then I've got some specular uh, paint, like a specular map, and then I've also got what's called a normal map. And so um, these things then just feed into the standard surface shader. And here, what I'm doing actually is um, just to back up a little. Houdini is a 3D application similar to something like Blender or Maya. 3D Max, but Houdini has its own special magic, which is that it's really good at doing procedural things. In this case, I'm using the solid angle render, render which is also made for Maya, um, which is a PBR render, meaning that it's physically based render and it is, uh, you know, the engine itself is thinking about physical based reality. So things like specularity and roughness and metalness and all these things that contribute to the materiality of a texture. 
I'm not going to go too much more into that because I'm just going to focus now on like I've got this character and how do I set up this Rembrandt light? Now I have a question that's probably jumping the gun because mm. I'm thinking about like back in college and being in a lighting course now and you're working like let's say on a project or like you're lighting the character but the character has to go into a scene right so would you then like make the these lights so that they're only applying to the character and therefore they're not interacting with the set as well like would you end up like no no okay no so this is this is a great question um what you want to do is it's an interplay between environment lighting and character lighting but if there's a character the character is going to be privileged and you allow whatever else is happening to happen you might be cheating in some lights in the environment by setting up like practical lights which is like oh there's a lamp there so i'm going to set up a lamp uh, a light that a light that kind of makes you feel like that lamp is illuminating the whole room even though i'm probably cheating i'm doing stuff like adding fills things bouncing off walls but mainly what I'm doing is I'm setting up a light that will do the right thing for the character and then everything else should fall into place. And this is why it's like this, it's this complex interplay between layout and character and whatever's happening in the environment has to support the character. Um, I mean, it's a really great question. And this is why I suggest watching um, the, the Magnificent Ambersons and even like the Apes films are really great examples of what happens when you light for moments mm. so if you have a scene and you have a moment that's the most important moment light for that and then let the character come into that moment and move out of that moment and don't have it so that the character is perfectly lit the entire time um it's much more dramatic to light light for the moment and then let things happen on either side of that moment i mean we've all done that like I think that we have to, as students, um, I never really understood what I was supposed to be achieving with lighting. I just thought, oh, I spent all this time modeling and texturing and building an environment. I'm just going to put an ambient light in there. Everything will be illuminated and then I'll render it. And, you know, what you've done is a huge disservice to all the other work you've done because you just flattened out all the stuff that you spent all this time modeling and putting in space. Um, and you know, I think with a few key concepts, you can light dramatically and all, and then that will accentuate the other work. Um, but I see this a lot in student work. And then also when I talk to recruiters, people that are looking for technical artists, they say that this is where student portfolios fall apart as well, is they just don't see the art direction and the lighting and that wow. then prevents them from seeing other stuff, yeah. Is do you use any light linking when you are lighting scenes? Oh boy, I'm really glad someone brought this one up. <laughs> In fact, I think I made a note for myself and I didn't get to. Okay, so the answer to that is mostly no. Mostly um, no. Mostly no. And I have a like a feeling of terror inside me about light linking for a very specific reason. When I went to Weta, um, our CG supervisor, the top level supervisor, um, who's won a lot of Academy Awards and is, you know, really the person driving the vision behind how we light um, was super technical guy and he was against light linking because of the same thing that if you light link then you're creating a scenario in which you're not letting things fall into light and shadow in a natural way um, and so he used to go into our scene files and look at them and if you were light linking you get called out in dailies where there are like 50 other tds sitting there so we oh my gosh. were like we lived in terror of light linking um and you know i think that um i really understand the philosophical perspective behind it which is that you light yourself into a corner you start to create all of these complex relationships that when you open up a scene and you look at the lights and things are light linked and suddenly they don't look physically accurate. Like, why is the eyeball so much brighter than the skin? Um, it's hard to un it's it's hard to dig through all of that and fix the lighting. And the other thing that usually happens with light linking, why people are doing it, is because the shaders aren't set up properly. So if you're like, oh, I need to light link the teeth to make them pop compared to the skin, that means your shaders weren't dialed in properly to work with each other under 
a, you know, that, that's what happens in the look development process is that you make sure all of your materials are responding to light in a consistent way. And if you do that up front, um, then you need to, then you don't have to do some of these hacks down the road. Now, down the road, what I tell my students is do not begin with light linking. Light linking is in the last 5%, like you're down to the wire. There's like a tiny highlight that you just need to hit from an art direction point of view. There's a problem that you can't solve. At the very end, go ahead and do it, but don't start there. Start in a holistic, realistic way and then make those tiny tweaks at the very end when you have no other choice and you need to art direct. So, um, the last question I have is that I know for today's uh, webinar, you focus really on character lighting. And I wanted to know how how much maybe is transferable to like prop or environmental lighting. Yeah, so this is... This is something I've been thinking more about because, because I come from this particular feature um, film background, I have always focused on the relationship between character and environment. But like um, environment lighting is a whole thing. And particularly in games when where people are more focused on world building, um, they want, you know, you need to think about how do you light at a scale for environments. And um, I guess this is not my area of expertise, but I'm trying to get better about it. And so thinking more holistically about lighting systems. And what I start with when lighting an environment is I first want to think about the practical lighting. What like and by practical I mean like what are the light sources in the scene? Where is the um are there is it nighttime? Are they lamp posts? What kind of lamp posts are there? What is the color temperature? What is the quality of light? And how are those practical lights illuminating the environment? And then I think about natural light, like moonlight, sunlight, setting that up. Um, because in an environment, if you set up a sunlight, you get most of what you need. Um, you get the shadows, and that's already setting up like 90, 80% of what. So like I think thinking in those terms and again looking at reference for like lighting and I, what, what I, one of the things I was looking into recently is that Unreal Engine has this great plugin that they've just pushed out for um, setting up <coughs> um, sunlight. And what it allows you to do is set up a sunlight, um, plug in the actual geo location on in the world and the time of year and the time of day. And once you get that, it gives you the sunlight at a correct angle based on longitude, latitude, location, time of year. And you're like most of the way there. And then what you do is another layer and you think about practical lighting in the environment, which gets you almost all the way there. So those are some strategies, I think, for thinking about how do you light environments. But it's something that I need to get better at as well.